Good evening all, and welcome. There are times in life where the inexplicable happens, events that cannot be explained, and leave everyone puzzled, with no idea as to how the events occurred. Such are the following 20 stories. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Lady White Rabbit for joining me today in this collaboration. She and I used to be co-hosts of The Dead Stream, which was a live stream with me, Cece's World and her a few years back, which was a lot of fun. So I'm glad we got to work together on this. We've each narrated 10 stories here, and over on her channel, we've done another video, where I also narrate half. I think it's very well worth your time. So please check out this awesome creator when you're done here. But for now, it's time to get spooky and let the darkness take control. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at mine. One day she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all night study session which she had known about and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going back to her place and I never heard anything from her again. After three days of texting her, trying to make sure she was okay, her messages started coming back as number not found. I sent her the stuff she'd left at my apartment in the mail and it returned as no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I had never messaged but knew the name of, disconnected. And it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates and didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings, just to make sure she was alive. The school she was at didn't have any record of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone. None of our mutual friends ever saw her again. And I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in this stretch of road between our two schools that night, or in the two weeks that followed. I didn't ask for a longer time frame because at that point, she was already missing. Cops wouldn't file a missing person report because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive, or in witness protection, or was erased from all time by an evil wizard. She literally vanished without a trace. I was 12 or 13. We had just moved to the UK from Texas the year before. We moved into the really nice farmhouse in the south of England near Wilton. We were completely alone for at least three miles in every direction. Anyway, on with the creepiness. The first thing that happened was in our kitchen. It was a large room with light fixtures in the ceiling. Those lights were flickering one night and I was just staring at them. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a girl. She was wearing a white dress with her hand on the window. It scared the fuck out of me. So I jumped back and tried to put my focus on her. But when I tried, she was gone. And in that instant, the glass on the light fixture fell. Second thing was slightly more terrifying. I was home alone. It was raining that night. Mom was out somewhere, friends I think, and I was just watching TV. It was about 9 p.m. and I could hear scratching. Not like a dog scratching the door to go out, like a long, continuous scratch. So, I looked around the house and I see nothing. I sit back down and watch TV and I hear it again, but it sounds like it's outside, so I dart out the back door and I look. Maybe a tree in the bad weather, but I saw nothing again. I come back inside, the TV is off, and the front door is unlocked. I shat myself. I ran to get a kitchen knife and my mom's old phone. I hide in the office that's on the ground floor and text my mom and tell her what's going on. She calls the cops and they arrive. They have a look around and see wet boot prints that walk in through the front door, lead into the kitchen, and then stop. No exit prints. This happened to my childhood friend, Jean. He was the only son of an immigrant couple. 
They had him in later years, so he lived a completely sheltered life and had a complete lack of social skills and social development. They had no other family around, only friends, mostly other immigrants from the same country. Jean's father was very well off, but he lived like a miser. So Jean grew up thinking they were middle class bordering on poor. When Jean was in his 30s, his father passed away from an illness. Shortly after that, his mother was tragically struck by a vehicle and killed as she crossed a busy street. Jean was left all alone and in charge of a fortune and assets he was ill prepared to handle. Out of nowhere, a relative from the old country appears. She was young, attractive, and a lady, supposedly a distant cousin. Soon she was seen with Jean here and there, not too often, but often enough that people began to notice. Three months later, Jean simply vanished. No one knew where he went, why he wasn't around, and now the cousin had control of the fortune. Another friend of the family got concerned and called the local police to report him as a missing person. The guy in charge told the friend to never inquire again about Jean, to better leave this matter alone. No one knows what happened to Jean, but several of us have several guesses. Scariest paranormal experience by far, a while back. I think it happened when I was maybe 13 or 14, 100% true. My best friend at the time invited me to his house for this New Year's party. It was an annual thing, so I decided to go. I arrived at maybe 7 p.m., and a lot of his family was already there. His cousins, Matt and Elizabeth, who are relevant to the story, his grandparents, their friends, and some other people I've never seen before. It was pretty chill. We hung out for the first couple of hours, playing backyard games and stuff, doing normal family things. We went swimming in his pool. Fast forward a couple of hours to around midnight. 2300. We had wore out a little bit and were getting a little bored, so we decided to go inside and fuck around on the computer. We were just looking up random shit, browsing the internet, when the topic of scary stories came up. And we all, me, my best friends, his two cousins, were all sharing stories experiences. The topic of Bloody Mary came up, and his cousins hadn't heard the story yet. My friend and I tried explaining how it works, but we were really shit explaining it, so we decided to show him a website instead that told the story and how to play the game. They thought it was total bullshit, so we challenged them to play it. And then we were going to have them record it from inside while they played. We decided to play it after we celebrated New Year's. Oh, 100. Initiate Celebration Apple cider and chicken nuggets and bound. 12.30. We all went upstairs for them to play, and we told them exactly how they were going to do it. Make sure you turn off the lights and light a candle. Then say her name three times and wait. They were beginning to chicken out, but we were steadfast in getting them to play. They eventually gave in and went into the bathroom with a small camera to record. Once they were in, we closed the door and instructed them to begin whenever they wanted. They began chanting the name, only three times. My friend and I heard them, so we knew it was legit. Once they were done, there was a pause for about a minute. You guys okay? My friend spoke first. Another pause. A reply came from the bathroom. Yeah, we're good. Nothing happened. Disappointed, my friend and I opened up the bathroom door and the cousins came out unscathed. That was lame, they said. I thought you said something would happen. In all honesty, I thought something would happen. They showed us the video, and it was indeed nothing. No interesting lights, nothing out of place. We turned the volume all the way up and put it up to our ears to listen for anything strange. Nothing. We thought that that would be it, but we were wrong. Throughout the rest of the night, until about 0300, the male cousin started feeling weird. He was quiet and constantly hunched over. Periodically, he would say his back or his stomach hurt. We brushed him off for the first 30 minutes, but once 0100 hit, it was starting to scare us. He told us that his back was really hurting, so we checked it out. We had him lift up his shirt, and lo and behold, there was indeed something wrong. There were three straight scratches evenly spaced apart along his back. They were red, and raised as if it had just happened. We got the chills, and had no explanation for it. We were with him the whole time, so he didn't have the option to do anything fishy. We kept a close eye on him, 
He went to go lay down, and we resumed normal activities. We checked on him an hour later, and he hadn't moved. We had him lift up his shirt again, and the scratches had gotten bigger, thicker. They still looked fresh. We weren't sure what to do about it. We were all scared, and he still said he didn't feel good. An hour later. We checked on him once more, and again, the same situation. Bigger scratches. Now it started in the middle of his back, and the scratch went to almost his side. There's not much more to the story. Nothing came of it. He felt fine the next day, and the scratches had magically disappeared. It almost seemed like a movie or some shit. I woke up at night for a glass of water. I walked into the kitchen and ran into my dad. He walked right past me to the front door, didn't even acknowledge me being there. Where are you going? I asked him. He didn't say anything and just had a blank stare and walked out the door. I walked over and looked out the window, looked through the peephole, and we had a small walkway that connects to our driveway. He was sitting on the hallway hunched over, elbows on his knees under a big tree. That was in front of my bedroom, just staring into nothing. I walked into my mum's bedroom and asked her why dad was outside. She turned over and said, what do you mean he's right here? There was my dad, laying by my mum's side, in a deep sleep. I grew up in a suburb in Philadelphia, in a nice town with a lot of great people in it. However, it's in a bit of rubble, meaning that the towns and areas surrounding it are not the nicest places. Crimes, drugs, homeless people, etc. My town never had much of a problem with these things, but once in a while, someone would come over and cause some trouble. This is the story of one of those times. I was 10 at the time, and my father and I had a habit of going for ice cream after my karate lessons. The ice cream shop we went to was a small outdoor stand right next to the gym. Yeah, great placement, I know. It was a quiet local place that was usually pretty busy. But since my karate lessons didn't end until 9pm, the time the shop was closed, we were usually the only ones there at that point. It was owned and run by an Irish man named Mr. Murphy, who knew us by name and always very outgoing and friendly. I should also mention that the gym and the ice cream stand were located in a large strip mall with quite a large parking lot, as it was notoriously frustrating to get out of as it had two one-way entrances but only one exit. One day, I had stayed at karate for an extra hour because my father had to work late and couldn't get me until 10. Luckily, the gym was open late, and my karate instructor stayed with me until my father arrived. The rest of the parking lot was fairly empty as most of the stores were closed. When my father finally came, we walked over to the ice cream stand thinking it was probably closed, but to our surprise, the metal screen was only half closed, and there was a light on inside. We figured Mr. Murphy was still there, and since he knew us, he might be willing to serve us late. My dad knocked on the counter and asked if anyone was there. No one answered, but we heard some rustling around, like someone had suddenly moved and knocked something over. My dad knocked again. This time, silence. We were about to turn and leave when suddenly the metal screen opened up. Inside the stand was not the friendly ice cream man I had known, but a tall, skinny, heavily bearded man wearing a windbreaker that was at least three sizes too small. I couldn't see what he had on below his waist, but he wasn't wearing a shirt, and he smelled like a dog after rolling around in the mud all day. He had a very creepy grin on his face, showed a crooked row of yellow, nicotine-stained teeth. His hair looked like it was falling out, his eyes were squinting, as if he couldn't see us clearly. He stared at us for a while, then crooked his head and started to speak. You buy ice cream? That voice. I still remember that voice perfectly. I'm not going to say it sounded inhuman or devilish or unnatural, because it's simply not the best way to describe it. It was... disturbed. It was delirious. It was a bit insane. And his smile after he said it. He tilted his head down a bit, so I could see the top of his balding hair, and his grin grew wide from cheek to cheek. My dad instantly grabbed me and turned me away. He shouted at the man, Who are you? Where's the owner? 
You buy ice cream. How did you get into the stand? You buy ice cream. I'm calling the police. It was at this point that the man had placed something on the counter. He held it in his fist, so I couldn't see it at first, until he opened his palm and held it out to us. It was a small knife, probably one used to cut fishing wire and such. Small, but sharp. My dad had enough at this point. He picked me up and threw me in the car, and he came inside and locked the doors, and he took out his cell phone to call the police. Meanwhile, though I was as scared as I had ever been in my life, I turned back to look at the stand. The man was not at the window anymore, but outside of the stand, walking slowly towards our car. Not only that, but he had the small knife clenched in his fist. I was choked with fear and couldn't speak, but I did reach over and shake my dad's leg. My dad looked out the window, saw the man approaching, and immediately turned on the car and sped off. I mentioned how there was only one exit to the parking lot. One of the reasons it's so annoying is that it exits onto a busy street with a light, and even at 10pm it can be difficult to get out immediately. We went through the exit lane, but had to stop at the end since it was a light and cars were speeding across from us. Even though we were stuck for a minute, my dad looked behind us and told me that he didn't see the man anymore. I was starting to feel a bit better, until we felt something thud against the trunk. We turned around and there he was, screaming something incomprehensible, banging on the trunk. His grin had turned into an angry snarl, and his eyes were open wider. I screamed as my dad decided to floor it into the oncoming traffic. Luckily, we didn't cause an accident, but my dad raced home at about twice the speed limit. Over the next few days, it was all pieced together. This man had apparently broken into the ice cream stand after the owner had left and was sleeping in there. The door was locked, but he was able to pick it. They got some fingerprints off the door inside the stand and were able to ID him. He had a pretty long police record, but no other documents of residence, ID, even birth. There was a current warrant out on him for aggravated assault and attempted rape. My dad went and gave an official statement on the incident to the police. But after that, everything just went pretty much back to normal, as they usually do in these stories. I don't know if they ever actually caught the guy. As far as I know, no one else in town ran into him. The man became almost a figment of my imagination, and if it weren't for my father retelling the story to everyone he knew, I may have even forgotten about it eventually. The only mystery left in the story was the ice cream stand. It never reopened after that night, and I never saw Mr. Murphy again. That's not saying much since I ever only saw him at the stand. I never asked my dad about it, and since I find it awkward to talk about the incident with him, seeing as he sees it as a heroic escape story, and I see it as a memory to forget. Still, I find it odd that such a successful, ambitious man like Mr. Murphy would close down his shop for good overnight. I guess that's the disappointing part about stories like these. There's always that one unsolved detail that you might bring back to the memory you want to forget. Update. So I talked to my dad today and remembered to bring it up. He wasn't surprised that I didn't know or that he never told me, but apparently Mr. Murphy closed down the shop after the incident because the man did some damage to the inside of the stand that would be expensive to fix. The cooling system for the ice cream was nearly totaled, and since business wasn't good and he was nearing retirement anyway, he decided to close down the stand rather than fix to have it repaired. I never saw him again only because I had never seen him outside of the stand. My dad said that he had moved out of town a while ago. He doesn't know where. And I guess that solves that mystery. I feel sorry for the guy. He was nice. I guess it isn't as exciting an end as it could have been. But I'm just happy that nothing bad ended up happening to him. My family moved into a new home about four years ago. And I've always had an off feeling about the house. But I put it down to paranoia. I woke up in the middle of the night with scratches all over my body, but I had no reason to think I wasn't doing it in my sleep. I moved on to being a college student living on campus. I haven't woken up with scratches once. Now home for the holidays, the first night staying back in the house I woke up with scratches. I stayed again and woke up with scratches the next morning and my girlfriend finally made me realize it was only happening when I was staying home. 
So I stayed at her house for around four days and didn't get scratched once. Now writing this, I had just stayed in my house again last night and woke up with a scratch on my side. And now I feel more creeped out than ever. I don't own any pets and due to living on campus, my old room was taken over by my younger brother. So this happened sleeping in two different rooms. I've read about others experiences and next time I will sleep with gloves. I honestly don't want to wake up with new scratches. The thought of it is terrifying. It was Labor Day weekend of 2008. That Friday night, I went to my buddy's house for a few beers and we watched train spotting. I got back to my place about 11 p.m. I played with my turntables for about an hour and crashed. Now, at the time, I was living with my parents, so that night, it was me, my brother, mom, and stepfather home. Now, when I go to bed, I always left my phone on my desk, which was kitty corner from my bed, as so, if it vibrated, I could hear it. It was a Nokia, and we all know how loud the vibration is. Anyway, at 3.12 a.m., I was woken up by the light from my phone. Now, my chair was pushed in under my desk, so I couldn't actually see the phone but I could see the light emitting from it. I crawl out of bed, pull the chair out, and check my phone. No missed call, text, voicemail, nothing. The phone was just seemingly lighting up for no apparent reason. At this point, I go back to my bed and set my phone on the floor beside it. I'm still sitting up, and I notice that both of my computer monitors on my desk, their power lights are flashing independently from each other, in no particular pattern. This is starting to confuse me on what exactly is happening. I look ahead, and my dish cable box is doing the same thing. The LED on it is blinking. The computer monitors and the cable box are all different outlets. At this point, I think something is wrong with the power, so I get up and open my bedroom door and look down the hall. My mother always left the lamp on in the living room. It was on normally. The light was not... It was on normally. The light wasn't flickering. I go back to bed at this point. Now, it being September, it was still relatively warm out. I had my window open a majority of the way, and the blinds cracked a good few inches. I get the most overwhelming sensation that I'm being watched. Huge lump in my throat, hair on the back of my neck standing up. At this point, I sink deeper into my bed and pull the covers close to my face. Now this part. Every time I recall it, type about it, or speak to others about it, I still get chills. My walls seemingly started to make noise, like someone was scratching at them with their fingernails. All four walls in the ceiling, this loud, dragging noise. I'll never forget it. I don't know how I managed to fall asleep that night, but I did. The next morning, I asked my brother, who shares a wall with me, if he heard anything. He did not. This girl I was sort of seeing at the time was super religious, and when I told her what had happened, she began to get teary-eyed and never wanted me to talk about it again. I did some research on the subject of demons and ghosts, and with what happened, the time being around 3 a.m. and the lights flickering, I guess it's called the Devil's Hour as Christ was crucified at 3 p.m., and demonic activity is more heightened at 3 a.m. as sort of a mockery of Christ. I'm 29 years old now, and let me tell you, this is the most scared I have ever been in my life. Part of me wants to have it happen again, though, just to experience something like that again. This happened in an old farmhouse a few miles away from where I live, and the case is unsolved today. I live in Bavaria, Germany. It's an area with a lot of mountains and forests. This incident happened over a hundred years ago. The family who lived in the farmhouse, along with its two workers, experienced many strange paranormal things, like foot trails and the snow which just led to nowhere, a few meters to the edge of the forest perhaps, and strange sounds at night, and the youngest daughter was telling the family that she was often visited by a tall man at night. One morning, the whole family was found dead in their beds, Everyone had their heads smashed in with a blunt object. There were no signs that someone broke in, and the doors were all locked when the police arrived. Nothing was taken from the family, not even the gold necklace that the mother owned, 
which was right beside her bed and should be obvious if it were a burglary. The police also stated that there had been a lot of hate involved in the crime due to the brutality. The police investigated the crime scene, but didn't find anything. Another weird thing that happened in the barn. They locked it to investigate it later because there wasn't anything remarkable at first. But when they later returned, there was a rope with that hanging knot hanging from the ceiling. No one knew how it got there. Well, the case is around a hundred years old. And if it happened nowadays, the police probably would be able to solve it with modern technology. But the paranormal things surrounding the house really creeped everyone out. I've never visited the farmhouse, but many stay it's still haunted. I'm not sure about that personally. I was in a classroom with my roommate before actual class time. We were playing Uno one versus one using the teacher's desk. There were three people inside the room, me, classmate, and some girl with braids who we don't know. We just let her stay since it was common for students to stay and charge their phones in classrooms that didn't have classes going on in it. The classroom assignment lady from the business department went inside the room to post a sheet of paper that says we were going to have to change classrooms. We were in J406 and we needed to transfer to J402 at the other end of the hall. We got up, packed the cards, and headed to the classroom we were assigned to. Every classroom has two doors, and my friend and I were racing to be the first ones inside. Braided girl ran too. It was weird why she was following us since she wasn't part of our class. My friend and I were catching our breaths with our hands on each of the doorknobs of the door. Braided girl casually walked over to me and placed a hand above mine, which was still holding the doorknob, and carefully turned it to open the door. Now for an 18-year-old whose interactions with women are non-existent, I was stunned. Braided girl went in and my friend on the other door was grinning. Lucky bastard, he said. Fuck you, I replied. Go chasing after your newfound girl, he retorted. We decided to go inside the room and I was excited since I wanted to check out Braided Girl, but she wasn't in the room. She was nowhere to be found. It was impossible for her to get out of the room without passing by us since we stayed at the door before going in. She couldn't have gone out the window since we were on the fourth floor and there was no ledge to step on. She just disappeared. This didn't happen to me, but my friend. Back in 1998, I was at second grade and was coming home from school alone for the first time. I had a bit of overprotective parents since I lived about a block away from my school, and I was stopped by an elderly woman who said she had something to tell me. She said she had no husband, had lost her son years ago, and just wanted to give me a hug. Something about this woman gave me the creeps, and now later on thinking she did look and talk a bit weird, almost like she was a man dressed in old woman's clothes. But this could really just have been my juvenile imagination messing around. After asking me for a hug, she reached her hands towards me and motioned for wanting a hug. I took off and ran as fast as I could all the way home. As I ran, I heard her laughing really loud in a low, manly laugh. When I got home, I told my mum about it, but she wasn't worried at all and told me that it was probably just an old and lonely woman who needed a hug. Here in Finland, we have this magazine called Alibi, which has the most recent news about burglaries, thefts, and all manner of terrible, terrible things. And for some reason, eight-year-old me was not allowed to go anywhere near this magazine, obviously. But a few weeks after the incident with the old woman, I did get my hands on a copy, which was brand new. I read about an incident that happened in the area in which I lived, about a boy my age last seen by his friends hugging an old woman and walking somewhere with her never to be seen again. The case is still unsolved today, 15 years later, and it gives me the shivers, as that could have been me, but I feel for that poor, poor boy.
When I was moving out of my first apartment into my new two-bedroom apartment with my now ex-fiancé, we went through storage looking for good boxes and totes to use to move junk. We came across an old military footlocker my parents had floating around from years before that had some of my childhood knickknacks in it. Had a cool look and could fit a bunch of junk in it, so we took it to our new apartment. We didn't finish moving stuff till around 2 a.m. that night. We ordered food, ate, and we both passed out on the couch with the remains of the meal laid out on the coffee table in front of us. Ex-fiancé was a heavy and long sleeper, so I was the first to wake up the next morning. All of the wrappers and remaining food had been cleared off the table and was laying all around the floor, some of it a few feet from the table. I was a bit spooked, but figured she had kicked the trash off in her sleep. She did occasionally have pretty rough reactions to dreams. So I picked up all the junk and trashed them. I didn't tell her about the trash until a couple days later, when I came home to see all of my posters had been pulled off the wall and were on the other side of the room, leaning up against the footlocker. Naturally, I asked if she had moved it. When she said no, I told her about the food wrappers, and we joked about it being a ghost around. There were several more instances of stuff falling, always around the footlocker. Upon further inspection of the footlocker, we noticed there was a stenciled on name, Private Williams something, spacing on the last name at the moment. So every time something fell or we felt an exceptionally chilly breeze, I'd strike up a conversation about Ghost Billy, figuring that being dead must be kind of lonely so we'd keep him company. Anyway, I now have the footlocker back at my parents' place, storing a shit ton of movie and game cases. Whenever I'm back home visiting and I see the box, I always say hi to Ghost Billy and ask him if he's spoken to anyone new recently. The first house that my mum and stepfather bought after they got pregnant with my sister had a few weird things happen. When she got old enough to communicate, she would wake up with a rash on her back, crying about the bees on the ceiling. That was pretty much the extent of what happened in the actual house. But we had a detached garage, probably 30 feet away from the back door of the house. And the garage had a loft that I decorated and hung out in when I was in my early teens. It started when I was jamming to music one day and thought I heard someone come in. And being rattled through the toolbox downstairs, I shut my music off and called out to no one there. I turned my music back on a little while later, thinking I was hearing a quiet conversation going on as if someone was on the phone. I turned my music back off and called out again to no one. So I turned on my music quieter and swore I could hear some more rattling and someone opened and closed the door to leave. I packed up my stuff and go into the house to ask around, and nobody has been in the garage all day but me. I stopped hanging out up there. More and more I got a really eerie feeling about the garage, to the point where I don't like to even have my back to it in broad daylight because it makes me feel strange. Sometime later I was telling my friend about it and he was like, oh my dad has a camera, let's see what happens when we leave the camera there. So in the evening, as the sun was setting, he gets his dad's camera, and we sit up there facing the front room. In the garage, you climb up a ladder in the back of the room, up into a large hole in the floor of the loft, and if you look towards the front of the room, you can see where the barn doors of the loft crack open and leave in a bit of light. So this is a rectangular little camera that's got nothing fancy about it, very much like the ones that most people own. We have the lights off, set it facing the front, and as we descend, I take note that there's a little blue light on the back of the camera as it's recording, since I've already been tasked with retrieving the camera when we're done, and I want to remember what I'm looking for. So we go and talk with my mum who thinks I'm crazy. 20 minutes later, we go up to fetch the camera and the blue light is gone. What the hell? I reach out and feel for it and realize the camera has rolled over, not even onto its flat screen, but then once more onto its narrow top side to face the back wall of the garage. I grabbed it and bolted faster than I ever had in my life. We watched the recording and sure enough, about five minutes later, after seeing nothing, 
We then heard a thud and watched the camera seemingly roll over alone with enough momentum to not stop on the wide flat side, but to the next narrow end. We tried to leave the camera up overnight, but his dad came to get it and I never saw the recording again. Around 10 years ago, my Mamir died of a heart attack in her bathroom, less than a year after her husband died. This was July, if I remember correctly. My dad was absolutely devastated. I saw him cry for the first time in my life at her funeral, even though he'd been fairly stoic at his father's funeral. Life went on, though, undoubtedly in a darker mood than usual for a few weeks. About a month after my Mimir's funeral was my father's birthday, and he was working the night before his birthday into the morning hours of it, as per usual. My mother and I were up late, like 2 a.m., her on her computer and me on the PlayStation, when my dad came home. He worked around an hour away and didn't usually get home until 6 or 7 a.m. We asked why he was home so early, and he said he got a birthday voicemail from his mother on his phone while he was at work shortly after midnight. His phone never even rang. He just suddenly had a new voicemail. Phone log didn't show any incoming calls missed. He played the message for us, and it was undoubtedly my Mimir's voice on that message. She said it made her happy that he missed her. They had a pretty strained relationship and finished the message with a quick happy birthday song and a line from his favorite lullaby when he was a child. One of his sisters had a voice very similar to that of my Mamir, but she was younger and wouldn't have known the lullaby, nor that it was his favorite, and she denied that it was her. My dad kept the message on his phone until he got a new one and listened to it pretty frequently. The message was so bone-chillingly clear. I honestly don't think it could have been anything besides her. Only paranormal thing I've ever believed in. My house, which I rent, has a ground floor and two more floors, so three in total. I was getting ready to go out, and I went to the first floor, in my room to get my makeup. I went to the second floor in my flatmate's room, to do my makeup there. I go back to my room about 45 minutes later, and I see three of my purses on the floor, and the shoulder handle has been cut on two of them, and a little bit on the third one. Both purses are cut in the same way, in the same spots. I start freaking out a bit, because no one was in the house except me and my flatmate, and we've been living together upstairs the whole time. In the living room, which is on the ground floor, we had left the back window open, so the air could ventilate and we had had some people over the night before. The door in the living room leads to a tiny garden which is protected by a tall fence, which is more protected by a wired fence, and I doubt anyone could have just climbed it and come in, cut purses, take no money or cards from either of them, and then leave. The complex has eight flats, so all the tiny gardens are connected in a long line, but we are only connected to one, as we are the last flat in this line. So absolutely nothing was stolen or even moved, and we see no marks anywhere. But it's still weird, so I call the police to find an explanation. They come, checked the evidence, there was a wet spot on the carpet in a room about five centimeters long, and how the purses are cut. I thought it was a fox that went in the house, went upstairs, ate the bags, and left. Based on facts, that a fox tried to enter the living room one time, in the same way a few weeks ago. The police said it was not an animal cut, it was most probably a knife cut, and asked if we had any problems with anyone like an ex or something. We do not. Most people do not even know where I live, and especially how to get to one's room, as the house is pretty complicated. The stairs in the house are metal and spiralled, and you basically hear it from every spot in the house if someone is on the stairs. Police call forensics to ask for advice, and they say they do not know what they could do, as they can't take fingerprints off the bags because of the texture, and the wet spot is apparently dry now. Police say they've never heard of anything like it, 
and it makes no sense. They marked it off as a burglary and left. I have to mention that the night to morning before we had the music pretty loud and one neighbor texted us very angrily to stop it. I mean, he knows the house as we have the same structure. He was the only one with access, but he's like 75 years old. And all the encounters we had were really nice so far. So we were left with something or someone that comes to the house through the back garden that's protected by a very high wall and wired fence, comes through the living room, passes by the PS4, TV, expensive speakers, goes onto the hallway, passes very expensive shoes, goes up the stairs, enters a bedroom, cuts the handle to the purses, doesn't take anything and then just leaves. I slept in my flatmate's room that night. And today I went into my room to clean it up. And I found one of the missing handle pieces in my bed, under the blanket. What the hell is going on? I have no explanation for any of this, and simply wish I did. When I was around 10 years old, we're talking about 2002 here, I used to hang around a lot on certain chat rooms. One day, I met a guy who would show to be very unique. It started out with a normal conversation, but soon I learned that he could do things that I could not possibly explain, even though I found myself pretty smart for my age. It was a normal chat room, no webcams, microphone, or whatever involved. I was able to speak to my screen, and he was able to write his response back. This is how we spend most of our time. But it didn't stop at this. I used to test him doing mind games, like thinking about a number in my head, and he would guess them correctly, not failing once. I even remember that after a successful strike, I thought about infinite, and he was like, that's not fair, infinite is way too large. Anyhow, I was flabbergasted. I tried to tell my parents, but I think they thought it was a child's imagination and ignored it. I remained skeptical, though, so I constantly tried to test him. He could even tell me that my parents were watching Mr. Bean on the television, which was correct. Or that if I thought about red curtains upstairs, he would correct me since they were blue. Eventually, I just knew he was awesome. I couldn't explain how he was doing it, but he could see me, hear me and read my thoughts with no error. He even gave me a mail address, but foolish me, never saved it. That's something I regret every day of my life. Later, the chat room was disabled, and we never saw each other again. I've always been a skeptic, even at that young age. I knew I stumbled across something incredible, so I made sure to remember the details. To this day, I still have no clue what exactly happened, but I really hope I'll find out sometime in my life. I grew up in the suburbs of Charlotte, North Carolina. My parents bought a house from the 70s, complete with colorful toilets, pink and periwinkle, and lots of vibrant wallpaper. The house was not open concept in the slightest, with four doors to the outside, two staircases, and with many easy storage places and walls one could hide behind without someone in the next room having any idea where they were. The house has always creeped me out, even though we now have normal white toilets. One day, my brother and I left for school and my dad left for work, leaving my mum alone to get ready for work. While in the kitchen, she heard the electric pencil sharpener going off upstairs, as if someone was sharpening a pencil, on and off repeatedly for several minutes. She hauled us out the house and called the sheriff to investigate. The sheriff walked through the entire house, checking every little crevice behind every wall for signs of an intruder. When he got to the office, he noticed the storage closet that was never used was wide open, and there were the freshly sharpened pencils sitting on the desk. He couldn't explain what he saw, but it would be extremely easy for someone to slip in and out of one of the various entrances without anyone knowing. Things got even weirder when a few days later, my mum and I found another perfectly sharpened pencil in the passenger seat of her car. This all happened 11 years ago, and the weird pencil finding stopped there. But we are still convinced someone was stalking my mum, and we have dubbed this person the Pencil Man, and blame him whenever something goes missing, or isn't where it should be. 
I don't necessarily think this is unexplainable, but more of an ominous thing. When I was 19, my best friend's family moved into a 150-year-old house in the historic district. After a month of living there, her little sister suddenly decided that she would never go upstairs in the house again. She wouldn't tell anyone why. My best friend's room was upstairs, and she told me that she thinks she heard laughter in her room one night. An old couple passed away in the house, she thinks it's them, and said that she didn't feel threatened. Anyway, I was staying the night there, and she had a trundle bed that I slept on. I woke up in the middle of the night, and the lights were on, and she was still asleep. Her sister and her friend that was also staying the night were hiding behind the bed and peeking over the top, and they looked mortified. I asked them what was wrong, and the sister said, The monster is in here, while pointing at the door. I looked at the door, and it was my boyfriend. He was just giving a confused look. I looked back at the sister, and I said, No, that's not a monster, that's just my boyfriend. She said, No, he's a monster. I then turned back to my boyfriend and asked what he was doing here, and then I woke up. It was all a dream, but it seemed so real. A year or so later, my boyfriend started slowly dipping into abusive territory, and it got bad. It took me years to get out of the situation, and he still stalked and harassed me for several years after I left. Sometimes, I wonder if the sweet old couple were trying to tell me something. This happened some years ago. When I had the iPhone 4S, I was laying in bed when I received a phone call. I forget who exactly it was, or what exactly they claimed to be offering, but it was fairly obviously a scam of some sort. Well, not obviously enough. This lady was asking me for various details of personal information, which I was giving for some reason. I believe I've read about how people are willing to give up all sorts of information as long as they are asked by someone with the illusion of power or something like that. I was readily handing out my name, email address, confirming my phone number, and it wasn't until she asked for my home address that my common sense kicked in. I didn't need this lady or anyone affiliated with her making house calls, or even so much as sending me garbage mail. Why do you need my address? I asked. So I can process you, she replied. It sounded reasonable. It even made sense, assuming she was claiming to be doing whatever it was legitimately. But I no longer had the blind faith to hand out any information, in hopes that it was. My exact location was pretty much the last detail I was still hanging on to, and I had now decided not to relinquish it. Nothing too creepy had happened yet. Obviously, just politely, I declined and hung up. Well, that was where I ran into trouble. Now, she was literally using my name every time she said something to me. After I said nothing to her last statement, she repeats, Can I have your address, please, Sakura? I say nothing, take my phone away from my head and tap the in call button on screen, but nothing happens. The touch screen is now completely unresponsive. I'm unable to end my call. I vaguely know how easy it would have been, not too long previously, had I kept my cool as hell Motorola Razor. Still not saying anything, I hold the lock button until the slide to power off option appears. Of course, my touch screen is still unresponsive, so this was not a solution after all. Thinking back on it now, I could have just kept holding the lock screen button until the phone would have force powered off. But I guess I wasn't aware of that feature at the time. I had experienced this stupid unresponsive touchscreen issue before and during phone calls. This wasn't the first time I was unable to end phone calls on my own, but I knew that once the call was ended by the other person, the touchscreen functionality would return. But typically the person I'm talking to isn't completely intent on keeping me on there until I relinquish all my secrets. I continue to say nothing, 
Not only had I decided to not give up my address, but I wasn't even going to give away any more of my voice. So I lay the phone on my bed near me and buried my head in the pillow, waiting for her to give up and end the call. But she didn't. I could still hear her a short distance away. Give me your address, Sakura. I ignored her and stayed laying there. What is your address, Sakura? I've been silent for a while now. Any normal person would have likely given up on the conversation, but not this she witch. She still repeated her question, and I searched my brain for a solution. I found one. It's a fairly last resort. I take a trick from my experience jailbreaking my eye device. I seize my phone, which is still transmitting an attempt to ascertain my location, and hold the lock and home button until my phone is put in DFU mode. This essentially bricks it temporarily. I guess you put your phone in this mode when you are recovering your device, as well as for some jailbreaks. Finally, my link to this woman was severed. I brought my phone back from the DFU mode, and everything was fine after that. I wondered if she somehow had the ability to disable ending the phone call. I now figure it was just a coincidence that the unresponsive touchscreen glitch happened during the call. That's about it though. It was just a really creepy situation to be in, laying there in the dark, being unable to hang up on her, and her repeating the need for my address over and over. I never got another phone call about it, never so much as an email. Maybe it wasn't a scam and I missed the chance of a lifetime. However, judging by her willingness to talk to thin air for a few minutes, I doubt it. Until a few years ago, I still had an old slider phone. One day, I got a random call asking for some girl named Sarah. I told them that they had the wrong number, and they immediately hung up. For the next few months, I would get these calls asking for Sarah about once or twice a week, incoming from different numbers and different sounding people. Sometimes these calls came in at 3 in the morning. Well, one day I got a call and like usual I said I didn't know Sarah, and after they hung up, I went to my contacts and I hit redial. After I did, the machine took over and said the number didn't exist. I went back through my call history, trying to call some of the other people that had called me with the same result, a machine telling me that the number didn't exist. Every time I would get these calls, I would redial the number and still got the machine. I googled the number, but all I learned was that they were coming from North Dakota, Montana, basically everywhere in the Midwest, which isn't all that weird because I live there. I started wondering what was going on, so the next time I got the call asking for Sarah, I said, oh yeah, she's right here, and the other person on the other end said, no, she isn't, and hung up. Then things started getting weird when I started getting calls from unknown numbers calling me. Whoever or whatever was on the other end hanging up the second I said hello. The creepiest one I ever got was from a call I got where they didn't hang up after I said hello. I could hear someone was on the other end, just listening, but they didn't say anything. Just something really uneasy about it. Eventually, I switched phones and got a smartphone and I immediately stopped getting the calls. I haven't gotten a single random call in about three years now despite the fact that I still have my old number from my old phone. Thanks for listening. If you'd be so inclined, come check out my channel, where I talk about true horror stories, true crime, as well as horror movie reviews that are a little more lighthearted. Also, in case you're looking for more of these Reddit stories, there's going to be another compilation with Mortis Media right over on my channel. Thanks again.